Let's welcome Mark Lackey to the show today. I'm Billy. You're recording already? Yes, we're recording. The crowd, yeah. <laughs> the crowd. <laughs> Mark Lackey, you have a twin brother. I do. What's I'm, his name? My brother's name is Stanley. Stanley Martin Lackey, a.k.a. Stan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Okay. I, I just mentioned that because, one, it's... I think you have a pretty remarkable background. Remarkable in the sense of <laughs> historically connected to Christianity of some sorts. That is true, yes. But at the same time, because we were talking yesterday, right? And that's why Millie said, hey, you need to be on our podcast. Okay. And uh, I'm honored. So you are connected to Christianity, but at the same time, you're disconnected from a version of Christianity, right? So let, just, tell us yeah. about that background. You know? Which you want to hear first, the connection? The connection, yes. All right. Well, I am. I'm not happy about the family that I grew up in, but I am happy in this regard. I come. My genetic makeup, my background, is from a long line of people who were Christian. Uh, on one side of my family, my my father's mother's family, my maternal, uh, they left France. They were called. We call them in English Huguenots, and in French they call Huguenots. They left their lands and title to make sure they weren't persecuted by the Catholic religion. My, my mother's family, two or three generations ago, I have a, a great, great, great grandfather, and he was baptized in a stream at midnight on pain of death. And he, Vulcaner is their last name, and he started a church in Canada in a place called Arnbar. And it's still there to this day. That was in the 1800s with his name on it as one of the, as the founder of that church. My father's family, my great-grandmother was a Methodist minister. My father, mother and father, were wonderful, fine Christian people that I am honored to have their DNA in my body. My father was an only child, and as a small child, he was dying of typhoid. And his mother, my grandmother, a wonderful woman, took him to a tent meeting. Now, if you've never been to a tent meeting, you're looking, look up old time tent meeting. It's a tent in the middle of nowhere, and there's everything but snake handling going on. That's, I'm being a smart aleck there. But she said, she prayed, says, Lord, if you will save my child, I will dedicate him to the church. Mm -hmm. And he survived. Her mother, their relation was a Methodist minister. And my father was named after the guy who started Methodism. His name was John Wesley Lackey. John Wesley started Methodism. When my parents were going to have a child, they thought it was one child. My mother said she knew she was going to have twins but didn't tell anybody. My mother wanted to have a junior, and my father says, I'm not, I'm not having a junior because you're never yourself. You're always something junior. So in the Bible, the apostle John was also called Mark. John Mark. Oh, yeah. So I am Mark Wesley. Oh, wow. It was a, a variant of my father's name. My first name is after the god of Mars, and my middle name is Middle English for the West Field, Wesley. They came up in my, it still is a thorn in my brother's side. I don't know why, because they had nine months to come up with your name. They had like eight minutes to come up with mine, because <laughs> I'm eight minutes older than he is. <laughs> So, uh, in fact, I just ran. I was in a, a Spanish market the other day, and I'm, I'm attempting to habla español más bueno. See, okay, so <laughs> muy bien. <laughs> um, it's uh, muy gracia. I think it's corgada, but it's okay. So anyway, so, so I saw two little twin girls. I says, "But are your children twins?" My husband says, "Yeah." Oh yeah. I says, "Oh, you can always tell the firstborn because the firstborn's face is a little wider." Really? Uh huh. Yeah. Wow. And so I looked at him, and I didn't tell him. I says, oh, "You're the firstborn, aren't you?" He goes, "Yeah." And I go, how old are you? And they told me, I'm, I'm like 11. And I said to the father, oh, cuatro más años, quinceañera, man. You better save your freaking money. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you got two of them at the same time. It's going to be a tough. Yeah. It's going to be a gonna tough. going to be game. a 13, 30 añera. 30 añera. No entiendo 30 añera. 15 and 15, 30. Oh, quince. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, so anyway. <laughs> yeah. the, Tell that to the judge. Yeah, bad so, joke. Bad joke. Is that a joke? Oh, okay. All right. So, and I said to her, I says, you're the firstborn, aren't you? She says, how much? How many minutes? He goes, eight. I'm a one. I says, so my brother, my twin brother will say, 
oh, nobody remembers. And I looked at her and I says, you know, they say, nobody remembers. We both know, don't we? She says, yeah. Says, and you'll know, in 50 years, you'll still know how many minutes. Yeah. <laughs> she goes, yeah. And I was just going, yeah. So my twin brother's name is Stanley Martin Lackey. Stanley is Old English for a stony field. Mm -hmm. Stan, the Lee is the field, West Lee, West Field, Stan, Stony Field. And his middle name is Martin, which is igualmente for my first name, Mark of Mars. And interestingly enough, he's had a rather, he's had more difficult circumstances in life than I have. And I wonder if that wasn't a prognostication of things to come, a bit of a stony existence. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've ever, if you've ever plowed or dug post holes or anything, you know that Digging them or plowing them in a stony field is not fun. It's very difficult work. It's much more difficult than a nice smooth drill a hole, so on and so so forth. That's my brother, and he's a he's. What's a, my last name mean then? What's your last name? <laughs> For the kind of life I lived, uh, Godinho. No entiendo Godinho. ¿Qué es Godinho? I don't know. I Por, just know it's like Spanish. What does it mean? It must mean something. I don't know. I don't know. I tried. Right, I tried yeah, finding you did, out. all this life and you can't figure out what your last name means? Yeah. Oh, if my God. Actually, today we'll find out if somebody knows. Let me know what Ask Gutinho your wife. Means. She has a curious mind. She'll find out in 10 minutes. And yeah. Tell you. It's like, tell me what Munoz means. Munoz? I don't know. The Munoz. Is that moon? It's more known. Munoz, maybe. Well, it just tells me that maybe Latinos don't have the same curiosity that Caucasians do. Okay. That could be. That could be because be. my if I trace my my heritage yeah. like i only know i had like my grandpa grandma on both sides and it was like i don't know who were their parents and where they came from like we don't have that history of like oh yeah we came from spain and well party came from spain like we, came for from sure spain. Yeah. for sure yeah but but we don't know we can't trace it back to like oh yeah our grand grand grand, grand whatever great grandpa was from this region but neither does Millie. maybe right? you maybe know that, if either. you ask your father he will know you know, nah, I, doubt, you I think know. I've asked him, but he like he knows until a few generations. Well, I know the reason that. why I don't know nothing because we were super poor. You well, know, poor people, poor people, poor I mean, people, we they were, don't, they yeah, don't. We follow. were so concerned about staying alive, we didn't have time for that stuff. Some of my grandparents were very poor. So we were so concerned about staying alive, we didn't have time to think of those things. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. My family name is actually traceable back to 699 B.C. 699. Before Christ. Wow. My family bloodlines. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm not that guy. Yeah. My brother does all that stuff, and I have, I have cousins and relatives back in North Carolina and stuff where my family came from yeah. in 1775. That's like stuff I'm reading from in the, like I'm reading the chronological Bible. Okay. And I'm reading around that era with, yeah. uh, I think, King Hezekiah and then his sons and whatnot. So, I mean, <laughs> just to be able to trace back your family origins all the way back. Uh, they they sent me all the, <laughs> the documents. I thought, Phew, how do you read that out? You know, but yeah. my, yeah, I, from father to son, we are traceable back to the year 1026. So that's the connection. What's the disconnection? Of what? My Christianity? Yes. Well, you know, in 1940, if you said you would go to hell if you drove an electric car, which I guess that isn't true because electric cars started in 1912, okay? But if you do, you know, it was not a big deal, okay? My parents were members of the Assemblies of God Church, and all evangelical churches in America stem from one thing. It's from the Azusa Pacific prayer meetings in the early 1900s, 1914, 15, and so on. That's where all evangelical churches came from. And the Assemblies of God was one of them. They were fine, upstanding people, but they were, in today's world, we got very legalistic. First of all, they lived on farms. They lived in the middle of nowhere. So going to a casino was not a choice, Okay. You know, you couldn't, you couldn't, you separated yourself from God Almighty and you were hellbound if you touched playing cards, if you drank alcohol, if you smoked a cigarette, if you swore, said an off color word, if you danced, because that was, that was celebrating a Roman pagan ritual. I just, you know, I couldn't understand why the guy that said, almost to the front of the, the 
congregation and then started switching to the back. He's backsliding. He's separating himself from hell. I could not understand why people that celebrated God and everything they did had to pray themselves back into the kingdom on Sunday. You know, I just, I just couldn't understand it. I, and I don't believe it's true. I think it's absolute nonsense. It's creation of mankind, you know. And so I, my brother, my twin brother and I, I have a younger brother who didn't grow up under these circumstances, but my twin brother and I, uh, Christianity was all don'ts. And the other thing that really to this very day is a hot button in which I had a theological conversation with my my PhD, three master's degrees, Pentecostal minister, ordained, and uh, professor and dean of a Christian college about, says, where in the Bible is the word rapture? <laughs> it doesn't exist. Yeah. I've heard rapture, that. the word rapture was brought in. I heard of a guy on a, by a, a minister in 1835. So here's another thing that really just bugs the living snot out of me. The devil has several languages. Satan, the god of this world, the prince of the air. Mm -hmm. And one of them is lies. Mm -hmm. The other one is fear. Now, if you want to take advantage of somebody physically, militarily, financially, and spiritually, what do you do? You introduce fear into their life. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So I have learned in my adulthood, to go closer to the back chapter of this book, that Christianity is not about fear. It's about it's a celebration of love and life and joy and power. And we are tapped into a power that created this, this world. Christ says, I leave you so that somebody greater can come and give you the power. You will do all the things I've done and more. So as a child, the word rapture, rapture, rapture was, was always harped on. I would say preach, but literally harped on. So when you're a child and you've told it, you know, any moment, you could be taken up in the air. You're, you're going you're gonna to miss. In the twinkling of an eye, you're going to be missed. So this is a no BS deal. When you're at the skating rink and your parents are 30 minutes late, you're terrified that the rapture happened and you were left behind. Mm. When you do something, you're terrified that the rapture happened. I never, as a child, believed I would grow up to go to school, to have a family, to have a, no reason because I'm going to be dead. Nothing. And I think it was absolutely, completely usurious. Hmm. When every sermon that children seemed to be subjected to at the end of a, a week or was about how, and I can do a great Baptist minister, I want to tell you right now that if today, today, you may walk outside. You're here now, but you may walk outside and a bus <laughs> is going to hit you and you're going to be gone. Are you right with Jesus? Mm. This is your one time <laughs> right now, right now. Oh, man, you're good. Well, you haven't seen me stand. When I stand up, I get down. <laughs> I had a great uncle who was a wonderful, wonderful man. The Reverend E.L. Van Horn, Elmer Van Horn, who he and his sons, he was a fine, fine, fine Christian man, built a school in El Cajon, California. He, a church and a school, and let me tell you, he would get up there and he would sweat and mop himself off and get down on one knee. Oh, Ooh, nice background music. Thank you. Ah, yes, <laughs> well, well, we're going to shut that off ASAP. Number verified. Sorry about that, guys. So anyway, and he and when his congregation got low because people moved or died or whatever, he got a orange crate and a Bible, and he went down to the street corner of San Diego, California, and he preached the Word of God, and he filled his church up. What's he had a, he had a he had a ad in a paper, whatever the throwaway papers were. If you ever need counseling, if you need prayer, if you need somebody to talk to, call me twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, and I'll be there. And he was, he was an incredible man. But I enjoyed watching him mop his brow and get down and. And Mark Twain, a.k.a. Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain, wrote a, a, the, a, a paper about just that. And I, I can do that. I've sat down there in the front row. I know what it's like to go down there. We're going to go down. We're going to go down to that, that little pea patch down there. We're going to have a tent meeting. We're going to have a tent meeting for Jesus. <laughs> I'm telling you right now. 
So I know I, I, I lived through all that. And there were some really wonderful things. If you've never seen the movie The Apostle with Robert Duvall, if you've ever seen it, if you see the last okay. half of that where they're in a little church and he's, I'm going to stomp for Jesus. I'm going to stomp for Jesus. I'm going to... I have been in the Assemblies of God Church in Wheelick, Oklahoma, when the brother Sul Sullivan, the reverend, got out, and we all had a Jericho march around the inside of the church. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not That's kidding. That's a good you. one. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. And when I was a member, I'm a member of a church, and he asked me to what stay. What fell down? Huh? What fell down? It's not what fell down. It's what rose up. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. You're on the downside of that. Pretty cool. Yes, what rose up. <laughs> And I, I heard a line that I committed to memory by the Reverend Sullivan Sully in Willica, Oklahoma. And my minister, the minister of the church I'm a member of, this is 15, 20 years ago, asked if I would do a prayer during such and such time. And I says, yeah. I says, but I want to include this line. So then, gosh. Darn. Somebody really wants to talk to you. Yeah, man. well, they can want to talk to me later. <laughs> so let me kill that. Come on. Come on, baby cakes. Let's go. Here we go. Oh, well, I didn't want to play. All right. So we get ready to take an offering. Thank you, O Lord, for placing to our hands these precious tools of evangelism. Did you catch that? No, no. What? El dinero, the money. Oh, the money. Yeah, it's, dinero, say, yeah. Yeah, it's a precious tool to these evangelize. These precious tools. Of, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, O Lord, for placing to our hands these precious tools of evangelism. Okay, I have a, I have a good... I was told... Please don't say that. Please don't. What? Say that. They asked me when I was going to pray in church. I was the ending prayer for a big ching and big. I can't say that. <laughs> big deal. I, I I can get thrown in jail in four languages. I can't get out. Of any, so you know, don't please don't say that. So I I I throttle back. But anyway, go ahead. You okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I have a question. Yeah, because you seem to know a lot about different um, denominations. Denominations. Yeah, I know something. Right. About, yeah. So. I would love for you to say maybe like one phrase, like you don't need to go deep in on all of them because I don't care. And okay. when you talk about like all of these, to me, it sounds so confusing, but you know, there's yeah, Baptist, yeah, there's yeah, Methodist, yeah. there's Presbyterian, there's right, Anglican. Yeah. Right. I mean, you were telling us about the Anglican church um, yesterday and oh. that was kind of easy to understand, but Catholicism light, Catholic, system, Catholic light. Yeah. So many different ones. And I'm like, and my kids ask these questions all the time. You know, okay. why are there so many denominations? To me, they they kind of make sense, but I think we're going to get rid of them pretty soon in the scope of the history of humanity. I don't think I, so. I think so. I don't think so. Everybody okay. that has a blue sweater wants to be give with everybody that has a blue sweater. Everybody has a yeah. red sweater wants to hang out with guys that have a red sweater. You know, well, the, you know what the problem with you is? What? You have a red sweater. It's not blue. Mm. That's your problem. So that's what denominations are, just... Yeah, I think so. It, it, uh, I have this conversation with people. It's very, very, very simple. Christianity is so incredibly simple. You know, it's you. God the Father. There was an individual, part of the Godhead. His name is Jesus. Is is we call him Jesus of Nazareth or Yeshua, that came to live in a physical body, so that when God looks at Berto and goes, I can't talk to that guy. Look at it. Look at it. And Christ <laughs> says, have you ever looked at the sun and you put on a sun, sunglasses? Okay. Christ says, wait a minute, dad. Yeah. Yeah. He's a POS. Okay. You know, but I've been there here. Look at him through my experiences. So Christ, so God looks at humanity through the, through the eyes of Jesus. And mm -hmm. he goes, oh yeah, this happened to him and that happened to him. Okay. And Christ says, he's one of mine, dad. He knows that I understand. He's one of mine. He goes, you're right. I can look at you. You're imperfect. There's nothing about this world that's perfect. Nothing. Mm. Nothing escapes this world. Everything that's made here is made from the things on this world, including this skin sack, this clay. None of it lasts. It, it, none of it's leaving this. Mm. You can shoot her into outer space. It's still not, not leaving. So there was a being that was came into the flesh of a human being to become simpatico, to understand what we as human beings live, and then sacrificed himself, the second exodus. He was the blood sacrifice. Just like in Judaism, they had to have a blood sacrifice for sins. And it had to be specific, and only one guy could do it. And they had one, one guy per tribe that went in and talked to the Holy of Holies. Well, Christ became that blood sacrifice. 
So just like in the Exodus, you had to put that blood over the lintel so that the angel of death would pass by. And the angel of death is not your body is going to die. It's you're separated from God Almighty forever. That's the angel of death, okay? And so he became that blood sacrifice. And anybody and everybody that understands that, believes it, and calls upon his name becomes a child of God. We are all adopted children of God. And we every single one of us are equal. It doesn't matter tall, short, thick, thin, bright, stupid, uh, handsome, ugly. It doesn't matter. We skin are color. Skin, it's like a skin color, okay? You got 14 F-150 pickups out there. There's red, green, <laughs> blue. They're freaking pickup trucks. It doesn't matter what skin color it is. Is Cybertruck a pickup truck? A what? Cybertruck? Is it a pickup truck? No, Nintendo Cybertruck is. You don't know it? Cybertruck, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I live in the real world, not the cyber world, okay? So anyway. Yeah, yeah. So that is that is Christianity, you know? And when you say yes, and I remember the day, the moment, the hour that I said yes, after all this stuff, I had deals with God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And I, I was in my uncle's home in Phoenix, Arizona, 1143 West Townley, Phoenix, Arizona. And I had met some of his friends. I have an uncle. His name is Van Dick Gruenwald. He's my mother's brother. And, you know, he belonged to a big mega church. And his friends were just different than my parents. My father worked for the church all his life. And we were always broke. We ate beans the last month of every, the last week of every month. Well, you know, we're just so poor, and we're just this and that. If we could, if if we, God didn't create us to be poor, you know, He didn't create us to suffer like that. There's nothing honorable about suffering in in poverty. Mm -hmm. And my uncle's friends, they had lovely wives and wonderful children, and flew airplanes and had Porsche cars and went on vacation, did stuff. And he says, hey. You know, God says I can drive a BO Chevy. Why can't I drive a 911 Porsche? What's the difference? You know, and I thought, these guys are kind of cool. All the all the Christians and my parents were all, well, you know, if the <laughs> Lord tarries, well, if it's God's will, God's will. I had this conversation with a young man sitting in my in my, in my office who was a really reprobate, a, a really a great reprobate. You name it, he did it. Okay. And he turned his life around and has become a very devout Christian. And he asked me some questions. You know, when Christ died, he died for every sin, every sorrow, every heartache that ever was and ever could be. Every, every one, every single one. Do you think, it says, he, has a, he has a daughter. I says, your daughter asks you for a, a tootsie roll, do you give her a, a dog, you know, you know? Well, no, why? He says, well, I, I don't know. He says, well, maybe because you love her. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think that God, you have a family? You think God wants you to drive a car that's going to break down every four blocks? No. He wants you to have what you need and what you want. Amen. 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 Yeah. Amen. You know, I mean, yeah, amen. Yeah. He wants you to have a scooter that electrically charged up quick. Yeah. Okay. I says, I said, let me ask you a question. This guy's name is James. If I got caught doing something, I'm in front of a judge, and judge says you're going to do life without parole. Would you take your daughter, and they said, I'll tell you, if you cut that child's throat, this guy can go free. Would you do that? He goes, are you out of your mind? I says, yeah, I am, because that's what Christ did. He doesn't know you, Berto. He doesn't know you, Millie. He didn't. He, and he says, I will take the beef. They can crucify me. They can kill me. They can whip me. They can torture me, because I want to take, I want to take your judgment. That's the price that was paid. So... It doesn't matter. You want to live in a big house? Tell God you want to live in a big house. Then be prepared to do, you know, you can't say, that. where's my water? Where's my water? You got to get up off your dead behind and go mm -hmm. get some water, you know? I had this conversation with my son who is an interesting story in and of itself. I have a very dear friend, and it says biblically, anything two of you agree to in my name will be done. Anything will be done. And he and I, he's an old rock and roll star. His name's MJ Nelson. You want to look him up on YouTube. He's got great stuff. He's a killer dude. He's 80 years old. He acts like he's 55. He's got a good looking wife and he looks like a rock star and he drives a Maserati. You know, he's a cool <laughs> dude, eh? You know, and uh, um, we, when we get together, we agree on something. There's not one single son of a gun. You <laughs> <laughs> There's not one single thing 
that we have a, a gotten an agree on that didn't that didn't come true, not one single thing. So my son was looking for an internship to complete his degree. I don't know how to turn that off. To complete his degree at Cal State Fullerton, he had to have an internship. And um, uh, let me take care of this. Uh, uh, ding dong, you're done. Okay. And he just wasn't getting an internship. He's a very bright guy, but he doesn't look good. Okay. And people like pretty people. You know, he's let himself get chubby. He's just, it's just, it's just, it's a whole story. And anyway. So I said, you know, Ryan is his name, Ryan Wesley Lee Lackey. And I says, you know, son, MJ and I are going to get together. We're going to we're going to tell God you need an internship. You will? I says, yeah, because everything he knows, it, everything that I've we've, it's you know, okay. So we did, and um, he got a he he got the best internship in about two weeks that anybody had ever gotten at Cal State Fuller. I says, well, you know, it's because, of, yeah, but, Dad, I had to do the work. Yeah, smart. I like you had to do the work, but there's a hallway full of doors. One of them had your name on it. Your job was to open every freaking door. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess you're right, you know. Yeah. So he got the very best internship anyone had ever gotten, ever, at Cal State Fullerton. Okay? So I just, you know, God doesn't want us to live in poverty. He And poverty doesn't mean financial wealth. Okay, hmm. it can, and that's part of it. Some people are blessed that way. Some are others, but it means it means harmony, peace, love, care, kindness. And when you're really going through some very difficult times, I learned this through a very supernatural experience. That if you want to hear it sometime, I'll share it. But I only I only heard it repeated. I, I learned this when I was 19. And I only heard it repeated because I never heard it in church. I can guarantee you that. When I was reading in Ecclesiastes and Solomon, it says, only those who understand great sorrow can understand great joy. Mm. So for everybody who grew up in a play yard that had a teeter-totter, this is what it means. You know, you always had the kid on the other, get off and leave you and let you fall to the bottom, right? Okay, I was that guy. <laughs> so, but it can only go up as far as it has the ability to go down. It's this and that. It can only go up as far as it can go down. So that gives me great solace. So I, I know that when you're suffering, if it's not by your own hand, you know, you get drunk and drive into a pole, you're going to suffer. Tough. I have no sympathy for you. You know, but something happens that you're suffering. That means get ready because you're going to have the opportunity to experience great, great joy. People sometimes ask me, how are you doing? I says, well, you know, every day you're going to be the dog or you're going to be the fire hydrant, right? You know what I'm talking about? The dog pees on the fire the hydrant. The dog pees on a fire hydrant. So when it's your day to be the hydrant, be the best hydrant you can be because your day for being the dog's coming and you want to really enjoy it. So just soak <laughs> it all in, you know, <laughs> not literally, but you know what I'm talking about. Well, you made me think of our dog Manchitas who just can't wait to go outside every day <laughs> and be there you happy. Go. <laughs> now, if you want to confuse him, you go outside and you pee higher on a tree and watch him. It'll frustrate it. <laughs> just FYI, yes, I have done that. Okay. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my my twin brother does that. He lives in a place where there's a lot of dogs around. He's out by himself. And and uh, this is, well, that's such a nice day. I just smoked a lawn naked. Mm. So, okay, boy, he lives on 60 acres in the middle of nowhere. And nobody's coming around, you know, mm. and the dogs don't care what your fur looks like. You know, they don't care. So anyway. Yeah. So going back a little bit, um, yeah. talking about religions and how all these denominations, yeah. I agree with you because I always tell Beto, this world, we all are so different and it's church for everybody. Well, right? Christ is for everybody. If, if, those, those are the things you need to... That's if all the, the church matters. point you to Jesus, yeah. that's okay. You know, why we disagree so much or why we fight yes, I agree. so much? Well, the church doesn't have to point you to Jesus. Naturally, you're pointing towards Jesus. People cleave. They, they know truth when they hear it. Mm. You know, I've been around people that, mm. that, cra that crave truth. I've talked to people who are... Eh, I guess, more than one occasion, I've had this conversation with God. Says, you know, and I had to instruct other people that just, the Holy Spirit will speak through you. You have to be willing to open your mouth. And when you open your mouth, 
if it's not your time, it's not our time, nothing will come out. You open your mouth, it'll, it'll come out. And I was very concerned about being made fun of or ridiculed sometimes. And I have had conversations, spiritual, faith-based conversations with people who are hard, hard, hard boiled. I mean, thieves, murderers. Mm. I mean, hard boiled, been tortured, hard boiled, and they're just they're regular people, you know. And and they absorb it like putting water on a sponge. You know, people know what the truth is. You know, they know what the truth is. And if it's not the right time, it won't come out. But it, you never have to, you know, my grandfather, my mother's father said something to me that seems to ring truer daily. He says, you know, son, the first hundred years is always the toughest. The first hundred years? Yeah. I'm 70% through it. So the first hundred <laughs> years is always You know? Awesome. Yeah. And that's true. So... It doesn't matter what you say to anybody. I had a guy that stiffed me for some money in my in my business, and I, I said, you know, the most valuable thing you can leave your family, your children, is an honorable name, and you've just ruined yours for 85 bucks. Hmm. You're now a POS, and that doesn't mean piece of salvation, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's all these denominations, and it's like, you know, how can this be right and that be wrong? So Midwest, I've had some experience with Midwest people. This reflects also on my parents' situation, not directly, but you smoke a cigarette, you're going to hell. Smoke a cigar, you're going to hell. You drink a, yeah, well, what about all these people that line up after church at the buffet and the women weigh 462 pounds and the men weigh 375 pounds? That's what about not a that? sin. <laughs> Huh? They're killing themselves. Well, it's gluttony. <laughs> gluttony is a sin too. Yes. You know, I mean, does that separate you from God? I mean, you know, I just, you know, there's only one thing that separates you from God, and that's you. Mm. And I think of Christianity as like a uh, like a, a campfire. Or think of it in, in school. When you had all your homework done, you love to sit in the front row. You want to, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm there. I'm proud. I did it. I got it done. I got it done. I finished okay. my project. That's right. I got it done. I got it done. A campfire, what does it give you? It gives you light. It gives you warmth. It gives you friendship, right? Mm. Okay. So when you're embarrassed or ashamed of what you've done or what you haven't done, you move farther back from the campfire. It takes away the light. It takes away the warmth. The it separates friend. you from the friendship. Mm. God is always, the prodigal son isn't anything spectacular. It's the real deal. I don't know if you've had it, but I know that I've, I want to do this. And I get this time. I say, well, I've got this for you over here. Yeah, but I really want to do that. Well, I've got, but I've got this for you over here. I don't want to do that. Well, go do it. Okay. So you go do it and you spend six days, six weeks, six months, six years doing whatever you think you, and it goes like, you go, that's how it ends up. And you come back instead of condemnation and like, I told you, I, 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 well, if you're ready, I still got something for you. That, mm -hmm. That's gone, but I've got something for you. You know, that's what Christianity is. That's so hopeful, right? It's nothing but hope. It's nothing, you know, it's nothing but hope. It's all hope. And it's always the same. If you can breathe, there's hope. You said, uh, you said you have a church. So we met you at our church. Yes. So which church do you go to? <laughs> why, why do you have different churches? What do you look for in a church? Why did you even come to ours? What did you see here? Well, this is going to be very personal, and I don't want to disparage anyone. The church that I am a member of, I started going there. Do you want me to name the church? I don't mind. I don't care. Okay. It's a Presbyterian Church of the Covenant in Costa Mesa, California. It's on Fairview Road, right across from Orange Coast College and right next to Costa Mesa High School. And it was a, I grew up in a church that was all, all emotional. You had to do this and you had to do that. And I, I don't want to, and I'm a logical guy. I really don't care how you feel. I care what you think. Well, I really feel, I don't give a rat's behind how you feel. What do you think? Hmm. I had my son, well, dad, I just don't feel like going to school today. And he had a very serious medical condition. And I says, well, I don't care how you, I don't care how you feel. I think you're going to school. You go to school, you have a problem, go to the nurse and I'll come pick it up. But you are going to school. Okay. I, and I'm a father who spent days and months and weeks in hospitals uh, with dying children. And that will sober you up pretty quickly. And you get a chance to have a, I'm going to tell you one 
off the track story. My son was my son is a type A severe hemophiliac. That means that this pinch right there, if you ever have children in a pinch, that's three days in the hospital with with needles going into your veins and human blood products. Oh. Everybody his age died of HIV and AIDS. Everybody except him. Okay. So I'm at the Children's Hospital in Orange County, aka Chalk, on Main Street in Glacelle on the fourth floor where they keep all the cancer kids. And he was so rare when he was, there was only 3,600 children in America with the severity of situation that he had in America. Out of how many million? 3,600, okay. It's a teaching hospital and they frankly liked keeping them around and they did some stuff that they should have been sued into the Stone Age for. But that being said, he was undergoing some treatment and it, the suffering, I just cannot explain. I don't want to, and I hope nobody that ever listens or sees this understands how much suffering goes on. It's just, it's it's beyond the pale. So I go down the elevator outside, and God and I have a fist fight. And I'm going to be a little bit profane here, so I'm apologizing in advance. But says, I look at him and says, listen, you son of a bitch. You made me a promise, and you're not holding up your end. Mm. You told me that if I acquiesced my will, that you would take care of stuff. Let me school you on something, pal. That's not my child up there. That's your child that you gave to me to watch and guide and direct. And it says that angels are by the side of every child's bed to tell you how much you can take. Well, put in another about 15 four-letter words in a row there. It says they're not doing their job. Because we're freaking done. Mm. You're, and, I, and it says biblically that if a prophet is wrong once, you can never trust him again. Here's what your word said. Here's a promise that you made me and I accepted. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going back up there and this crap better be straightened out or you're a liar and we're done. Mm. I'm, I've had it. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not set. I'm done. So I, this took about 15 minutes and it was about 150 decibels, okay? I mean, I was stomping and yelling and screaming and, and just, I was, I was being a father. So I get in the elevator and go up to the fourth floor and the doors open, you know, and I couldn't see it completely, but I could kind of see it and I could feel it was like a mist. It was about about halfway up your leg, uh, between your knee and your ankle. And it kind of washed up the side of the, of the walls. And I could feel a very gentle mist touch my face as I walked through. I could feel it touch and go past me. And every single child in that ward, every single procedure, went as smooth as sliding a wet ice cube across a glass tabletop. There was no moaning. You know, these guys come in the middle of the night and wake these little kids up and stick needles in them, you know. And there's, there was no moaning. Everything was perfect. I just looked up and said, this is, we're good. Wow. It's all it took. The guy, they, they have a lovely word, it's called a phlebotomist, it means a vampire comes with a with a metal cart and glass test tubes going clinkity clankity clinkity clanky you know down the down the hallway at like twelve thirty one in the morning and as he comes in these little kids are going, oh no oh oh you can hear the moans coming down. And sleep is the only thing, the only place that those little children get any kind of a respite from the horrors that is their that are mm. their lives. And he walks into my son's room, and I says, not this one. He goes, well, I have to. I says, let me explain something to you very simple. See that line? If you cross that line, I am going to beat you with a half an inch of your effing life. Not this one. Mm -hmm. But it's on my schedule. I don't care what your schedule says. Cross the line, and we're going to get down. You understand that? Well, is that a threat? Is that absolutely a threat? Yeah. Not this one. Not tonight. Who is this person? The phlebotomist, the guy who takes blood from little children at oh. 12, 1, 2 in the morning, wakes them out of the dead sleep where they're getting respite from the horrors of the treatments they are mm. to stick needles in them and suck their blood out. Yeah. And so, you know, God and I have a relationship. Yeah. Well. You know what the word, you know what Israel means? The word Israel? 
I can't really call right now. Well, you're lucky I can. Please. It means to argue with God. Mm, that's true. Yeah. You know, you know why God picked Jews to be his people? Because they were freaking stubborn. Mm. <laughs> they like to argue. Yeah, they argue. They're stubborn. You know? Yeah. I got a Jewish joke for you. A friend, a Jewish friend of mine told me the other day. <laughs> you ready for it? Yeah. Two rabbis are sitting next to me. Oh, I can't believe it. What's up? My son, he's become a Christian. Oh, no. How about you? I got the same problem. What are we going to do about it? I don't know. Let's talk to Shem. That's the Jewish word for God, okay? Let's talk to Shem. So I get down and say, Shem, we got a question for you. <laughs> I'm already laughing. I don't know why. <laughs> Shem, I got a question for you. He says, well, what's up? He goes, oh, both of our sons, they become Christians. What do you do? He goes, what do I know? The same thing happened to me. Uh, <laughs> mm. His yeah. son turned Christ. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, son became Jesus Christ. Okay. That's yeah. What do I know? Same thing happened to me. Mm, that's a good one. That's well, a good one. I wonder what, ah, whatever. That's good. Okay. Yeah. So here's a few of the, the news that have happened in Did over, I answer over your, the weekend. Did I answer your question at all? Yeah. Okay. All of them. The, okay. Do you have any more? No, I'm just fascinated. Oh, you, you asked know? me why I would, the church I went to. Oh, yeah, yeah, that one. So I was heavily burdened, and I was in a post office in Costa Mesa, California. A gentleman came up, and we're talking. He goes, oh, you look like you got something on your mind. He says, yeah, you know, I got a few things going on. He says, well, I'm a member of a church over here, and uh, we got a new minister. He's about your age, and... Yeah, just say hello to him. Yeah, come over and join him. Yeah, dude, I had enough of church. I'm not, no church for me. And say, well, you know, you might be interesting. So I gave him my business card. He gave me his. And about a week or two later, I got a call from a gentleman who is a wonderful minister by the name of uh, Tim McCalmont at that church. He says, oh, let's sit down and chat because I'm new here. And, and, you know, he was logical. It wasn't, it wasn't this. It wasn't, oh, you know, tomorrow when you walk out of here was, hey, and I, I thought, so I went there and when I went there, all the churches that I had gone to, I was somebody's grandchild, somebody's nephew, somebody's son, because my family was so connected. I mean, there were evangelists go, you know, I remember when you were just a year old, you really <laughs> shot up. I mean, very connected in the assemblies mm. of that church, you know, and I was just marked. And it made sense to me. It wasn't. It wasn't all that emote stuff. Which, if it works for you, God bless you. It doesn't work for me, okay? And I, I really felt the spirit of God. I felt like I was really damaged, and I went into a hospital room. I says, "We'll take care of you." I, I met people who were like grandparents to me. People who were like parents to me. Loving, kind, caring, non-judgmental people, and that appealed to me. And I became a very significant part of that church. I taught Sunday school. I did children's sermons. I did. I was a member of the property and finance committee. Um, I was instrumental in building a house for Habitat for Humanity. As a contractor, I, I improved the property in a bunch of different ways. It would have saved the church probably $150,000, $200,000. You know, and I was really, I have very little family cohesion, which is a nice word for saying none. And these are, well, you know, my parents never talked to me, and I was never good enough for anything, as good as the Miller kid. And the, you know, my father never used a cuss word, never smoked a cigarette, never touched alcohol, and came from a, he was, you know, I mean, he was, he was that guy, he was head of the youth group. My mother was a church darling. They grew up in all that. I know I, there wasn't anything my brother and I could do that was good enough, nothing. It doesn't matter, because I, you know, I, was, I was next to St. John, you know what I mean? So... <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> it's true. And uh, it just really it was a wonderful, that's the family that I've chosen. Mm. Now, that minister has gone, and we have another guy who is a wonderful, gifted man, and I enjoy him. Uh, the church is dying because the people, when I was a small child, when people moved to a town, they, they look for a school and a church. Mm -hmm. When I was in grammar school, you knew who didn't go to church, and now you don't know who does go to church. Mm -hmm. And they just, they're, con you know, I don't remember where it is biblically, but, you know, when you were sailors, you have to, to relate to sailors. When you were, and they just, 
it's like muscle memory. They're, they're just stodgy in a way that doesn't sell anymore. Christianity is a sales job. If you stood on, if I guarantee you, if you stood on a street corner and said, give me a $10 bill, and I'll give you a $20 bill. You still have to talk people into it. Human beings have a natural resistance. It's, it's pride. It's whatever. It's a natural resistance. And they, and that's, that's how it works. So you have to continue to, uh, you know, as you said, lovely wife of yours, Millie, be the light. Mm -hmm. If you are where there is no light, you are the light. If you have, I had this conversation with a friend of mine yesterday who was here. I said, if somebody has to ask you what you're about, you're not about it. Hmm. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it needs to show. It needs to show. That's right. Everything yeah. you do. That's right. I had guys, I'm very, a couple of times, one guy in particular, a friend of mine I was in business with who was a murderer. He'd murdered 17 people plus, Okay. He had reasons to, and I agreed with him. That's okay, you know. Some so. people just don't need to live anymore. I'm, 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 I'm okay with that, you know. And he says, "Man, I don't know. I don't know what you've got, but I'd sure like to have it." I says, "Well, here's how we, here's how we do it." Wow. And he, he was a very, very, very devout Christian man. You know, I said to somebody, "I work on furniture and stuff." And he goes, "Why well, do that?" Because it goes, well, "I'm Christian by church." Yeah, I can tell. If they can't tell that about you, then you're not doing what's supposed to. Because you, you, I, and you out there are the physical body of Christ. And it should leak out of you mm -hmm. just like goodwill. And if it doesn't, check your six. Go back and see what you... And just, you know, live a life of victory. And you can... I My shop was near a lot of homeless guys up and walking up and down. And it's very interesting because I... They're all they're all human beings. Mm. I go, hey, hey, you need a cup of coffee? Yeah, man. I listen to their stories, and their stories are full of destruction and heartache and terror and fear. And so, but you know what? Every one of those people is God's child. Mm. You know, and and if that doesn't soften your heart, then you need to check your six. Mm. Check your six means look behind you and check what's what's going on. Mm. So that's that's. I, so I, I come. I to was district. thinking about check your six pack. <laughs> so like, what is that? Uh, or keg. <laughs> or keg. Yeah. Or as my <laughs> redneck friends and my brothers says, this is the only thing I have that's paid for. Okay. So anyway, but uh, yeah, I come to this church because I'm taught. Mm. I go attend the other church on Saturday evening often because it's my family. I've seen children this tall grow up to be fathers and and executives and and military men and and I and I love and care for them. They're my family, the family I never had. Mm. You know, we're not all DNA blessed with a family that mm. we, you know. You don't get to choose your family. Mm. You choose your friends. Those people are my family. These people are becoming my family. But I'm taught here. I'm just not taught there anymore. I'm I'm I have passed the, the theological boundary where I'm not learning anything there. Mm. And if I'm not being satiated, why would you eat food that doesn't fill you? Mm. You know, you can eat potato chips all day long, but all it does is make you want more because it just doesn't fill you up. Well, I think part of being satiated, it's also maybe cooking for others, right? So, well, that's all part of the ministry. You know, that's all part of being of being a child of God. Yeah, yeah. So um, you might be entering a. Another, like even being here and sharing your story. Absolutely. Me. I'm all for it. Bring it all on, right. baby. Let's go. It's sharing. Absolutely. Every day I say, look, Lord, I'm an empty vessel. Use me wherever it takes. Use me whatever it takes. Let's go. I'm down. Let's go. Yeah. And you know what something, happens? Yeah. He, he takes you up on it. Yeah. Mm. All of a sudden you got a guy that's a drug addict sitting in front of you going, well, I did this. I said, well, that's kind of screwed up, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Why do you think you did that? Well, well, here's what I do and here's why. Yeah. That's what I tell Millie sometimes. Like, I love, I still love learning. I'm not going to say, oh, yeah, I know it all. I never want to get to oh, that point. That'd be the first lie right? you told. Okay, exactly. Yeah. But at the same time, I tell Millie, we're in an age, we're, we're parents, right? So we know a few things. Why not start sharing those, right? And try to be a vessel of a little bit of the knowledge that we have for other people that maybe don't know. That's your responsibility, your duty, and your honor to do that. Mm. If you yeah. don't do that, 
you funked every IQ tester. That makes you a selfish prick, okay? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You learn stuff. If, if you, You're telling your children not to run into the street, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Why? Because I love him. Yeah. Yeah. And it's to their benefit. Yes. If you've been down, a teacher only has to stay one paragraph ahead of the, of the student. That's why I learned about teachers. They're not brilliant. They're just one chapter ahead of you. That's, mm. that's all I have to do. <laughs> that's right? Good. Yeah. I'm right. Yeah. I like you that. Yeah. I, I was with somebody and they go, well, you've seen a lot. I says, well, you know, in another 50 years, you, you should know some stuff too. Yeah. You know, I mean. Okay. So you know a lot of stuff. I'm, you're very, uh, you said, you're very recent, what do you say, recent oriented. That's one of the things that kind of I don't of understand recent oriented. What is That's it? what you said. You said you came back to church because it wasn't so sentimental. It was more. That was 30 years ago. Yeah. But it, what would if you said something like, I don't know if it was recent, but you said something like. Um, it was reasonable. Reasonable. It's not, it's not an emotional appeal. Right. It's a reasonable appeal. Okay. So I want to ask you about a few emotional okay. uh, stuff that had happened over the weekend. Over and the I want to have your take. Over this weekend? Yeah, over this okay. weekend. All right, yeah. And I want to have your take okay. with all the the background that you have of you know Christianity, your parents, the... You know, being angry by, at your by years of hedonism. <laughs> yes, like all of that. Okay, just to see what's your take, because some people are claiming what happened here it's okay. spiritual. Okay, and some people can maybe like over spiritualize it to the point of like, yeah. you know, calling it demonic and things right. like that. And yeah. I know you have a side of you that is, is blunt about that. You know, because we were talking about yes, I have, I have seen demons. I have okay. Seen, I've had conversation with demons. Okay, so let's. Let's show something. Okay. This is going to be, uh, let me see if I can put it here. There we go. We have you. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Different angle, please. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Let's just have, oh, no, that one can't really see you. There we go. We'll uh, have that. Okay. Okay. So this was the uh, uh, Olympic ceremony. Okay. The opening ceremony. Which I didn't watch. Yes. But. Uh, so they had some sort of representation. Oh, yeah, okay. Some people are saying this is offensive because they're they're mocking the Last Supper, and they have a blue guy there. There's another picture. I hope I find it right now, where where you can tell it. It kind of looks like the Last Supper this painted by the, the Last Vinci. Supper with drag queens. Yes. Oh, That's, okay. All right. Right. Did you hear about that? I did hear about that. Okay. So that what was going on over the weekend, I guess. You want my opinion on that? Yes, I want your opinion. Okay. And let me see if I can find just a, oh, here's another one that's a little bit better because it shows. I've seen that in Milan, Italy. I've seen that. Oh, cool. Wow. So you've seen the actual yes, painting? Yes, I have, I have seen the actual painting, yes. Okay, so there we have it, right? It's okay. on the bottom. We have Jesus and the disciples painted by Da Vinci, okay. right? Yeah, was it Michelangelo or Da Vinci? Uh, what I read was Da Vinci, but I could yeah, be wrong. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, yeah. And then the top one, okay. I, and I then the know. top one is the opening ceremony of the Olympics, uh, with people of what seems like drag queens and stuff, right? Oh, let's call oh. like is they're freaking drag queens, okay? <laughs> yeah. And there's a there's a woman in the middle with a dais on her head that makes it look like she's it's sort of like yes, yeah, okay, okay. So a lot of Christians call this mockery, even like people like Elon Musk, right? The the guy of Tesla and mm -hmm, yeah. X, right. formerly Twitter, right? Um, and some other people, right? And th there's a ministry I follow who they actually went to to friends and they were just interviewing people on the street. And what do you think of that? Oh, it's fine. You know, it's a little mockery or whatever. Like, would you feel the same if it was, if, if they were mocking Islam right, or other things like, we know what oh. happened. <laughs> we know what happened if they mocked Islam. <laughs> So, yeah. but this is France too. And then also right well, here, I have for a, Americans that'd be speaking German in 1917 <laughs> and, and, and 1941. Uh, so I don't, I don't respect French opinions. Okay. So the, the creative director of this whole thing yes. came out on YouTube. There's a video of him. It's short and it's like a minute. And then he says, well, we're in France and we're all about inclusion and diversity and we portrayed it pretty well i think <laughs> you know so he's kind of like defending his point like we're in 2024 
what's so bad about what we did, right? He's the guy that basically made this whole uh, table with the drags, but also there were other features that were happening yeah, that yeah. night, right? There, I mean, Celine Dion was singing under the t Eiffel Tower and stuff, right? So it's, that was kind of lovely. It's like dog poop with honey on the top, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you see any demonic in what was going on? From your vantage point, from your experience, even like you said, you've talked to Satan or dem demons, you said? I've had conversations with demons, yes. Okay. Yeah. So do you think there's something to that in France? You really want to know? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely, because... Be reasonable. <laughs> I'll be very reasonable. <laughs> Satan has pulled back the curtain. The things that used to be veiled are not veiled anymore. Mm. I've had I had a young man at work for me that was gay. Okay, I I loved him dearly. I still love him. He did some terrible stuff in my life, but I still I still care for him. You know you know why the rainbow is a symbol of of homosexuality? Do you know why? Because it's an affrontation to God. It takes something that is godly and turns into something that's not godly. Do you know why gays want the word marriage? after their name. I've had this long conversation with gay guys, okay? Because that makes it normal. It's not normal. Marriage is a is a contract between a male and a female between God and those two people witnessed by people. This look at it, look at it. they have they have what would be Christ as a female. Mm. And they have all these drag queens. That is a complete affrontation to God. That's a complete yeah. And that is Flat, out, flat Satan. That's flat Satan stuff. Period. That's it. And what is unfortunate, you know, you know the story about the boiling frogs. Are you familiar with this? Yeah, like if you boil it, like little by little. Yeah, they, they don't die. Them. So as I was having a conversation with your lovely wife, there are gateways that have become. Oh, it's no big deal. It's no big deal, and it is a big deal because it's an invitation. I listened to a minister. And his kids were talking about watching this thing. He goes, well, but it was dad, it's just a little bit. Says, well, tell you what, how about if I make some brownies and I put just a little bit of dog poop in it? Just a little bit. <laughs> Would it be okay? No. Says, well, why this? It's absolutely, it's an affrontation to God. Hmm. It's it's absolutely Satan, Satan inspired. There's absolutely right. Absolutely. God made Adam and Eve. He didn't make Adam and Steve. Okay. That's just how it works. I've had this conversation with gay guys, you know. What I've, they say. What? Well, I got one of them, I finally says, look, regarding gay marriage. I says, I know these things because I study them. I have friends who are gay. I said, they had every single privilege, every single opportunity to do exactly the same thing as someone who was married under the law. But they want the word marriage con as part of their, their identity to make them, to normalize it. And it's not. They go, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah, they agree. They understand. Oh, he was telling you. I was telling him. Oh, okay. I said, we're talking about gay, yeah. gay marriages. Does oh, what we have to have marriage. Want. Well, because we can't, this is all, oh, that's a bunch of bull crap. Oh, you can do this, you can do that, you can visit, you can do that, you can leave your property, you can see him in the hall. Oh, I know that's true. I know it because I know people like that. And it's because they want to normalize it. Well, yeah, you're actually right. They can finally admit, yeah, you're right. They want to appear to be normal. Hmm. It's not normal. It's aberrant behavior. Has it existed throughout humanity? Yes, and it's been aberrant since the beginning of humanity. Hmm. You know, they say, well, you know, like 10% are gay. Oh, that's a bunch of crap. It's like 0.01%. I, I, in fact, I, I know a guy who's gay. I'm going to be a great surprise, my hair cutter, okay? All right. And he said they had a family reunion, and his sister brought her wife. And I thought, God, you know, like your sister's gay too? Because yeah, this kind of runs in the family. He goes, yeah, it really does. <laughs> I mean, it really did. I mean, there's some genetic things to it, but you know, some some people genetically want to slam heroin. It's not the right thing to do. Hmm. You know, so that is a complete affrontation. As a click, yeah. And anybody that accepts that, that has the knowledge of what it actually is, they're validating it. Yes, absolutely. I, yeah, absolutely. So what was your encounter with demons? Well, I can tell you several, but one of them, I had a guy that worked for me. His name was Marty, and he was a, he was a terrific guy. And he was a, he was a bona fide, 100% tough guy. I mean, bona fide tough guy. 
he was living in a home that was getting ready to be foreclosed on. They asked him to let him take care of it. Some gang guys came up and says, we're taking this house over now. He goes, no, you're not. Yeah, we are. He got in a fist fight with one of them, the leader of F Troop in Santa Ana, California, and got him over the hood and was taking him to Fist City because Marty was a tough guy. He was beating the snot out of him. All of a sudden, he felt like punch, punch, punch inside. He reached down and looked. But he got stabbed seven times, okay? What did he do? He went in the house. He got a gun, came out, and blew the son of a bitch's face off, okay? <clears throat> then he got in a car and drove himself to the hospital until he fainted about halfway there. The guy that got his face blown off, unfortunately, survived. Wow. Yeah, he blew like, you know, when they... Only the ear? <laughs> no, his cheek, his eye, oh, part wow. of his skull, you know, all the stuff you think should have happened to all of them. And so Marty, we had an understanding. He he worked for somebody else. He came down to my shop one time. He goes, he was a very quiet guy. He goes, you know, I'm at the other shop. I feel this thing, like this thing following me. I feel like a shout. It's around me. I says, yeah, I don't know what it is. I know what it is. You do? He says, yeah. Well, when I'm in here, I don't feel that. He says, yeah, you know why? Because son of a bitch isn't allowed in here. Mm. You know, I'm Christian by choice. He can't walk through this door. Mm. So we were on a job one time in Newport Beach, California, Newport Heights, right over here, not far from where we're sitting. Mm -hmm. Wonderful customer. We we're going to go into their media room where they had, I work on leather stuff, and we we're going to do some repairs on their, their leather media seating. And there was a hallway, which was probably about 12 feet long, and it was dark, and it had a high ceiling. And it was covered in crucifixes. And Marty was walking behind me about six or seven feet. And I get in, he goes, whoa, what'd you do that for? I says, what'd I do what for? I says, you pushed me, man. I felt your hand on my chest. You pushed me. I, 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 I says, Marty, I'm six feet in front of you. My arms aren't that long. Well, I, I don't know what it is. He had to go back into another room. He's, he's going, man, I don't know what the feeling was. I, oh, man, I don't know. That was terrible. I don't know what that feeling was. I don't know, I don't know what happened. I says, I look at him and says, I know what happened. And the voice goes, no, you don't. I says, yeah, I know who you are. No, you don't. Yeah, I know exactly who you are. You're not allowed in here. Get out. No, you don't. It was a demon. And anytime you want to get rid of Marty, it says, God bless you. And that demon goes, what did you say to me? I'm leaving. He had succumbed to a ailment called Guillain-Barre. And that was a guy named um, Andy Griffith had had that happen. And here's how it manifests itself. He woke up and Marty was a complete reprobate. Okay. You know, I won't go into it in great detail, but there were women that lived in his house that asked him he wanted a particular kind of service before he had breakfast. And he determined, and if you know what I'm talking about, okay. He woke up one day and he couldn't move. He was completely, totally paralyzed. He couldn't even blink his eyes. He lay there for about eight hours until one of his girlfriends came over and said, what's going on? They took him to the hospital. They did a tracheotomy. They did all kinds of stuff when he was 100% awake because they thought for sure he was catatonic, 100% awake. And, he, and one time we're talking, he says, oh, man, you can't believe it. He says, I don't know if there's a heaven or hell, but I've been there. You have? Yeah, well, tell me about it, Mark. He didn't open up to many people, but I was non-judgmental, and we... We shared some opinions about things, you know, which he respected. And he respected the fact that I was who I was, you know. He goes, yeah, you know, all of a sudden I was in that bed, and then I'm, I'm like walking, in a, and I'm not walking on a cloud, but it wasn't like a side of it. it was firm. And I walk, and I get up, and he's a no BS dude, man. I'm telling you, no BS. I get up in front of these gates, and the gates are like a mile high and two miles wide, and they're... They're all shiny like pearls and stuff like that. And it's really incredible. I'm banging. I'm like, let me in. Let me in. Let me in. Let me in. And this great big hand came down and pinched me on the side of my head and picked me up and turned me around and went. And I had to start walking. I couldn't stop. I kept walking. I couldn't stop. And I'm yelling. I'm screaming. I'm cussing. I'm calling everything in the book and everything. And but I can't turn around and I keep walking. All of a sudden, it's like I stepped in the man. I'm like, I wake up in my body. He says, I don't know where I was, man, but it's real. I've been there. And I said, okay. So 
Another experience I had when I was like 16, I decided I was going to try astral projection. I was going to split my soul from my body, which you can do. Mm -hmm. You can split your, you can, you can voluntarily give up your body. Satan really needs to be invited. Mm -hmm. Demonic forces need to be invited into your life. Mm -hmm. And there are things that are traditional ways to invite demonic forces into your life that have been disguised in the past a lot of people knew what they were now they don't you know there are certain kinds of music that are absolutely demonic and when you embrace that it invites satanic beings into your life mm. there are certain actions i'm gonna scratch my ears oh it's gonna go <laughs> certain actions that invite uh, demonic beings into your life there are certain activities and there are drugs that invite demonic beings into your life. The English, and I never, I grew up in a house that I didn't know what alcohol looked like. The English called rum the demon rum. There is a demon in that bottle. If you imbibe too much, there is a demon. Would you agree with that, Millie? Yes. There is a demon in that bottle. I, I have personally known between six and 12 people who were cured of epilepsy and cancer by cannabis, extractions of marijuana. So it has a, a purpose. But I also know that too much of that invites demonic forces into your life. I know that LSD and ayahuasca and all those mm -hmm. things open doors that for some people allows them to have demonic manifestations in their life. Mm -hmm. And you don't know if it's going to be you or not. You know, so I, there, are, you know, there are games like Dungeons and Dragons that invite demonic forces into your life. There are, there are films. In fact, well, I saw one, and I don't remember what the name of it was, but the character actually turned around and goes, who do you think you are, Jesus Christ? And I thought, wow, that was out of character. But that was in the film. It was in the movie. They know. Yeah. You know, I had a young man, I had a man that worked for me who was very interesting. His father was a merchant marine and uh, and a drunk. And this guy had to literally put his arm under his father and carry him home out of a bar. And, and uh, when he was 18 years of age, his father got a couple of sacks of groceries and walked him down about three blocks and into a lady's house and says, here's where you live. There's your food. There's your, your, I'm done. I don't want to know you anymore. And he had gone up at one time and got a 12-gauge shotgun, filled it full of slugs, went down. He, <laughs> he literally, in the room before he went downstairs, prayed to Satan to fill him with demonic forces. Wow. And he felt all this stuff go into him. He went down and he stuck the gun in his father's mouth and was going to blow his head off. And something stopped him. Now, he later, he was recruited into Christianity by Rosie Greer at the USC campus. And he could never get rid of those demonic forces. I don't think that the demons lived in him, but I think they tormented him because he had willingly accepted. So when I was 16 years of age, having had all this, you know, legalistic Christianity shoved down my throat with a hot poker. I would try several other things. So I tried uh, astral projection, where you actually, you can concentrate and split your soul from your body. Your body is a gift. And I was in Oceanside, California, getting ready to go surfing. I was staying with a friend of mine and his grandparents down there. And uh, I was successful. I was successful. I got almost down, like in, in uh, Peter Pan, where he comes to Wendy, and wants to have him stitch her to stitch his shadow back onto his toe. Well, it, when your soul leaves your body, there's when you get down to the last nanite, the one billionth of a, of a of a meter, if that's gone, you're gone. It's just like if you're an out if you're at a space station and you and you get a, a nanite, a billionth of a meter away from the space station, you're not tethered. You can't get back. There's no way to get back. And I saw that my gift was, my body was a gift. 
And I saw that if I split my soul from my body, there was no guarantee that I could get back in because that's a gift. If you get, if your child gets a toy for Christmas and he willingly gives up to the neighbor, the neighbor may give it back, but there's no guarantee he'll give it back. And what I saw was that there were demonic forces that was like, it was kind of like almost like one of those old science fiction shows, but there were, it was blackness and there were door frames. And these demonic forces were, were peeking around the door, the, the corner of the door, salivating and <laughs> literally sounds like that. His drool was coming, waiting for me to split myself on the like they could rush in. This is long before the internet. This was in, I don't know, 1969, 68, 69. And I understood that, that they would take your body over and you could maybe get back in, maybe not. Mm -hmm. And the word walk-in came into my, my, my brain. I looked up in the library and other sources and a walk-in is when somebody, all of a sudden the next day they change, they change, they're different. I heard this just the other day on, I thought it's been a long time since I heard that. I know exactly what it is because they have a different spirit, literally a different spirit. Mm -hmm. And you may get back in, you may not. People with multiple personality disorders, they've invited, have been, they've had multiple spirits enter their body. You know, you talk about the spirits that, then when, when guys was at Christ or the, the, threw all the spirits out of the madmen, and they went into all the pigs, they just want a body. This body is a, is a. There are things that can be done in the physical and the spiritual world inside of a body, a human mm. body that cannot be done mm -hmm. anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And they know that and they crave that. Yeah. And then I watched a film. It was uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula. I think it was by Oliver Stone. And when he had these, these demonicers doing this, I thought that son of a bitch has been there. That's exactly what they look like. That's the real stuff there, man. Somebody knows what they're talking about. Mm. And... I also saw something that was very interesting is because, you know, the Egyptians talked about when you leave this life, you go across the river Styx. Are you familiar with this by any chance? Never. S-T-Y-X, Styx. And you know that when they used to put pennies on people's eyes, are you familiar with that? Oh, yeah. I've seen it in movies. And the reason was because it takes two pennies to pay the boatman to take you across the river Styx. It's not to keep your eyes closed, <clears throat> to, to boatman across the river Styx. So you, I was ensconced in, in learning about, you know, that's long before New Age became, but all kinds of different spiritual stuff, you know, from Scientology to this, to that, the other, blah, blah, blah. And they tell you, well, you know, when you cross and you get a chance to make this decision, blah, blah, blah. Well, when you cross that, when you cross that river, there's a bridge. There's a bridge that goes across that river. And when you get ready to cross that river, the, the bridge splits in two ways. And that split is not on the other side of the river. It's on your side of the river. And when you make that decision and you cross that river, it's all over. Whatever, whatever happens to the nth degree in this life while you're in this skin sack, that is what is cast in stone for all of eternities. Mm -hmm. That's it. There is no second chance. There's no second chance. Your chance is right now. Mm -hmm. Your chance is while you're living. And as long as you have a breath and one heartbeat left, you have a choice. But the second that heartbeat stops, it's done. If you wanted to apologize to somebody, no more. If you want to make up with somebody, we can tell somebody you love them. If you want to say, call upon the name of the Lord three times, it's over. Nothing's, that's it. It's over, period. That's it. It's, it's utterly, totally, completely final. Yeah. So that's when I learned also at another time about I kept wondering, gee, I wonder why, 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 you know, I wonder why, I wonder why, I wonder why. I was sitting in a movie theater right across from South Coast Plaza and Edwards Theater at that time with my then girlfriend by the name of Carrie Falstad, getting ready to watch a movie. And I got this tap on my shoulder and on top of my head. And then here's why, and boom! It wasn't abrupt like that, but the power of that knocked me out of my chair. I was sitting on a floor. And it was like, it, was a, it looked like a little hole here that I looked up. And as I started to go up, the hole got wider and wider and wider. And, I, and in that time, I, I traveled someplace else. And it was, it was 
dark, but it wasn't dark. And I saw, and I and in that in those moments, I saw and I understood every single mystery of the universe. It was everything. I literally saw equations from like pi r square and e equals mc square, and I understood every single bit of it. I understood about volcanoes. I understood about history. I understood, I stood, I understood every single thing that ever was or could be as I'm traveling towards this light. And the light was just a pinpoint light. And I'm thinking, wow, this is ultimate knowledge. This is pretty cool. You know, I could go for that. And then I got a tap on my shoulder and says, and here's the price. Mm. Start going the other direction. And as I went the other direction, it got darker and darker and darker. And I realized that what I was headed for the first time was to be in the presence of God Almighty. And I was just just going through those stages. Now what I'm doing is I'm going away from God. I'm going in the complete absence of God. And let me tell you, it was like an ice chip compared to Antarctica, what I felt. And it was so terrifying soul crippling it was so empty it was so void it was just oh i i i started begging i said oh just make me human just make me human again i don't want to i just i'm uh, just make me human again you know and after a couple of seconds i came back in my body and my girlfriend goes what's up with you why don't you sit on the floor what happened to you and i said well i'm, I'm good you know i got up and sit down and like, father mucker that was a hell of a trip you know, so when Christ says he went to hell for three days, I know what that's about. Wow. I understand the complete, there is, there are no words, there's no expression, nothing that can define being in the absence of God Almighty. Hmm. My friend Marty, unfortunately, he, he passed away. And I lament to this very day not having a conversation with him about, about Christ. He like said he had this guillain Barre thing, he, he came to life, he came back to life, and he was terrified. He did, he, he did a lot of drugs because he was terrified he was going to wake up again and be paralyzed. He couldn't go through that again. Mm. And he was living in an office next to my shop. He goes, oh, man, I can't. I, I, I. So what's up, Marty? Man, I, I've been sleeping in my car. I says, you got, you got a bedroom there. Where you? Oh, man, it's different. Do you like do like the walls in your shop get hot? I says, what are, you, what are you talking about? He had a bed next to a wall. He says, in the middle of the night, that, that wall gets really hot. And I hear, Marty, Marty, come back, Marty. He goes, I don't know what's going on, man. It terrifies me. I ter I got to sleep in my car. I can't be in there. He says, I don't know what's going on. He says, I know what's going on. You do? Yeah, yeah. Wait, that's the same Marty? Same Marty. Okay. Yeah, the, the demon, demon possessed Marty. He says, you want me to get it to stop? He says, you think you can stop? He says, I can't, but I know how to do it. And what's that? He says, says, hand me that book over there. And he hands me a book. And, yeah, that's my Bible. Bible, oh, 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 Bible. Oh, I says, yeah, here, I'm going to burn you with it. Here, here. Yeah. Let me burn you with it. Hey, tough fucker. Oh, pardon me, tough guy. Let me burn you with it, you know? <laughs> and he says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to open this up to the 23rd Psalm, and with your permission, I'm going to print off the Lord's Prayer, and you're going to leave this book in your office, open the 20th of the Lord's Prayer, and that son of a bitch can't come in there anymore. You think so? Says, I know so. So he, he did that. He didn't have that problem anymore. About a month and a half later, he says, I think I'm good. He gave it back to me and started again. You tell me what you think. I know what I think. I've seen it. You know, I saw those demon, demonic forces. Mm. I've spoken with them. You know, I know, I know it cast them out. The church that I'm a member of, there's like those, those brownies with a little bit of dog poop in them, you know? That, that, that's amazing because I have encountered with the devil too, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah that's true. crazy. Yeah. And now I can detect him. Yeah, you can smell him. Yeah. And even, yeah. it, and, and I go uh, maybe a little bit extreme, but even with my kids. Yeah, of course. When we're can. at home. Yeah. You know, because he wants to divide us. Of course. He wants to hate the, the hate. Uh, he wants to govern my, my home. Of course he does. And I don't allow him. So what I do, I just, I, when I see the anger 
in my kids, like yeah. the transformation. Sure. I just closed my eyes and I started praying and calling Jesus and my kid changed like this. Absolutely. Like his face, if you totally different. Okay, Mark. And how, sometimes how? I just open the door. You know, I just get out. You're not allowed here. <laughs> yeah, right. You rebuke him. Yeah. Just, I just want to say, how do you, how can you help us as parents and, you know, people, I mean, have a Christian podcast and we talk to people all over the world okay. from here. Yeah. But we have our kids, right? Three of them. Okay. And with your experience, your upbringing and the really, re what? Religiosity that you witness in your oh, parents and amen. almost like that, uh, Oh man, my parents, you know, they, they didn't give me the time, but they gave all their time to the church. Right. How could you help us? Maybe in that sense, you know, knowing that this spiritual battle is real, like you, you acknowledge it's real in the deep. Oh, it's, real. it's more real than us sitting here. Right. Mm. Yeah. Uh, do you see any danger or, or how would you help us? You know, as parents say, you know what, if you take us to this level, you're you're in religion and you're not in like just help us you know i'm just saying maybe well, you have a word what you no. witness what you wish wouldn't have happened to you because i'm sure your parents maybe i don't know if the point to say you know if you smoke you're you're in hell i think they did whatever, the best right? thing they could i think they were ignorant i think they were ignorant and i think they okay. were okay so were, help us not be ignorant in that sense well, but at I the can, same time technology i'd be glad to if i can you know yeah what would you say just to us as parents you know that maybe you wish well first of all you're not always right had. you're not always right mm. okay and for my child and i uh, i just said look i told him my job is not to make decisions for you my job is to teach you to make decisions mm -hmm. and we're going to make i'm going to we're going to have a situation And I'm going to say what I think. You're going to say what you think. And most of the time, it's going to be what I think with a little bit of your input. And each time, you're going to have a little more input. So the time you're 16, 17, most of the decisions will be made by you. And it'll be right more than they're wrong. You know, that's, the, and, uh, and I think to live a godly life. I, you know, when I say a godly life, what does that mean? That means <sighs> my son has been privy to the fact that he has been a recipient of more than one or two miracles, mm. you know, point out when this happens, Hey, I also point out that, look, we got a, a situation. Here's what this book says. It says anything we ask in his name, let's ask, let's get this taken care of. Live by example. Mm. You know, everybody makes mistakes. I listened to a guy this morning. He says, He says, you don't think there's evil in the world? People are normally good. You ever worked in a preschool? <laughs> <laughs> He says, I was in a sandbox. A kid did something. I took a truck and I hit him over the head with it. You know, I'd go to jail as an adult. They think kids are, you know, just let them know that. And the other thing is that bring up children in the way that they will go, the way they, and they'll, they'll return to that. You know, there are all kinds, there's no end of, of opportunities to be disappointed in human beings. But what else is there? You know, you look at the guy did this and this, but what else is there? You know, I think it's important for people to know that nobody's perfect. Mm. We usually do the very best we can until we can do better. Mm. And then we do. And I think that that's grounded. I don't think, I know that that's grounded in biblical principles. You know, it was like for various and sundry reasons, I had to go to Al-Anon, which is an offshoot of AA. It's for people who are dealing with people who are under addictions. And there isn't one single thing that they talk about that wouldn't benefit every single human being on the face of the earth. You know, biblical principles, and I have friends who are not Christian, but they follow biblical principles because they know that they work. Mm -hmm. If you do this, you get that. Mm -hmm. If you do this, mm -hmm. this is what happens. And... and, and, and I don't know where my son is spiritually. I know that he's grown up with, with Christianity. I also know that he was abused in a private Christian church school that if I could find that guy, I'd go and I'd, I would rearrange his nose and his ears, okay? You know, but, but Christianity is about love and care and kindness, and you need to show that. But, you know... Mercy without judgment isn't mercy. There are things that you need to be held accountable for. You know, when you poop the bed, you need to be held accountable for it. 
It doesn't need to be draconian. It doesn't need to be vicious. It's just a realignment. And I think that done with a loving hand, whatever that means, is, and I think a child grows up to look at their parents. I think you need to be, a father and a mother are a tremendous responsibility. There was a guy who said, the hand that rocks the cradle mm. controls the world. You know who that was? Who? A Adolf Hitler. Oh, and he's right. That's why that's why they want to influence children. The hand that rocks the cradle controls the world. So make sure that you're a loving, caring, kind, realistic parent. My family, we had Doberman Pinsers. And they're very strong-willed dogs. And here's what happens. You're fair, you're consistent, and you're not you're not brutal. Mm. And they will follow you anywhere. Your children they need to be fair, mm. consistent, and not brutal. And, you know, and be, you know, be the light. Mm. Let them see what happens. If you get mad and you beat your wife, you know, it's not a very good thing. If you get mad and you have a conversation with each other and you work it out, mm -hmm. then that's that's what they'll do. You know, and I that's fair, consistent, and and humble in a sense. I told my son, hey, we made some messes. I did this and I was wrong. Mm. Let's, let's 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 go back and try it again. You're I'm not always right. You're not always wrong. Mm. That's that's and you know, be the friend you want to have, be the father you'd like to have had, be the employer, the employee, the husband, the wife, the nephew, the son, the daughter that you would like to have. Mm -hmm. That's a standard rule of measurement in my world. Wow, that's a good one. Yeah, it's like the golden rule, no. Well, the real golden rule is the one who has gold makes the rules. That's the real golden rule. <laughs> well, it's not the the Jesus golden rule. Jesus never talked about a golden rule. Or, well, they just where call is it in the, the Bible? golden rule. Yeah, well, I think it's just like they use the word rapture. Okay, you know, I, I'm I'm not buying it. You know, do unto others before they do unto you. Right, that's the real golden rule. Okay. But, Some issue the better and I we have, and you mentioned before. Um, my, I grew up poor, okay. right? Right. And we live by faith, and faith. we faith, and we always just have enough. Okay. Right. Right. And I. We want I you to pray ask, for us so that I there's three here and we have more. <laughs> I don't. I don't. Okay. Right. I don't like to ask God because Why sometimes. Why not? Because sometimes, like He knows me. He knows what I need. No. Why I need to? No. Because and then I compare myself oh, with, yeah, with yeah, John yeah, yeah, the yeah. Baptist. He was killed. He was in jail. So what? So I don't know. It's hard for me. Well, get over it. Who I am to ask things to him. You're his child. If your child was hungry, came mom, you're just going to waste away? Mom, I need something to eat. What would you do? I will fit him. Okay. That's what your child does. You ever, mom, I'm hungry. Mom, it wins breakfast for you. You ever hear that? No. Have you, <laughs> they, have you ever heard it? <laughs> have you ever heard it? Yes or no? Yeah. Like oh, a million oh, times oh, in my oh. life. Oh, and what did you do? What did you do? I cook and I give them food. Really? You got a God in heaven that created you and sent his son to, to be slaughtered just for you. And you don't have the guts to talk to him? To How us? How ridiculous does that sound? I'm serious. I'm serious. And there's reason to cry. Go ahead and cry. You've been denying your heritage and your privilege. You have you have insulted God by not asking him for what you need and want. He's waiting for you to talk to him. It's hard because... I don't care when, if it's hard. When I it's ask, hard to put your shoes on. When I ask for things, I didn't see that happen. <laughs> well, it's okay. Well, maybe you saw it in different not ways. Not all the time. Right? Look, you're in another country. You got a wonderful husband. You got something going on here. That didn't happen by mistake. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. So here we go. Get your freaking tissues out. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> go get them. I'm a yes or no guy. I'm not a. I'm not. I'm yeah, grab the whole box. <laughs> throw them. Okay, don't throw them. All right. Here, one for you. 
Yeah. Two for me. <laughs> That's the last one. Berta, you want one? Are you too macho to give uh, it up? I'll just do it on my kiss jacket. my ass here. Take that. Okay, yeah. You have not because you ask not. Anything you ask in my name will be given unto you. Right? Do you ever read that in that book? What I listening to that this morning. That's why it's like, you're talking to me, God. Right? Okay, so I'm going to try and keep from crying. Not that that matters. So I'm going to start. You guys chip in as you feel free or don't. I don't, it doesn't matter to me because, you know, Shem and I are going to have a conversation here. Okay? Compose myself for a minute. I see this sometimes as weakness. I can't stand being weak. It's probably prideful, but that doesn't matter. Dear Lord God in heaven, we don't have to bow our heads. We don't have to look at we look up. You know who we are. Mm -hmm. You invited us to be your children. We accepted that. We are created. Berto, his lovely wife, their children, myself, second only unto angels. We are the heirs to heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. These wonderful people who are doing your work here need stuff. They need a car. They need financial assistance. All that stuff. What's paper to you? It means mm -hmm. nothing. We are in agreement, are we not? Are you agreeing, Berto? Yes. Millie, you agreeing? Yes. Okay. Lord, they haven't asked. I don't know why, but they haven't asked. So it's time to show up. Come on, Dad. I have been as lowly a guy that rubs dead cows as I am. A witness to more miracles than I can count on my fingers, times my toes, little and small. This is not a miracle we're asking for. This is you bringing the required instruments, materials, mm -hmm. comforts that your children, your children, we didn't ask you to become your You asked us to be your children, that your children need to continue to be wonderful parents, the most important thing on the face of their wonderful godly parents, to continue their Christian broadcast. Mm. And what does that mean? That means that they are talking to people in places where they couldn't only get to about how wonderful it is to have a relationship with a creator. That's you mm. through your son. We're not praying to Jesus. We're praying to you through your son, through the sunglasses that you sent so you can look at us, our imperfect beings of clay. Mm. For them to have to struggle to move forward in, in sharing your word is just, that's over. We're saying that's over. Mm. Anything you ask in my name, we're asking for them to be blessed with an automobile or two mm -hmm. that will take care of their needs and satisfy their needs, not just to honor you, but to honor them. They're your children, Lord. They're your children. They're suffering in little ways or small. We're not meant to suffer. We're meant to, to glory. We're, we are Christians. We are followers of Christ. We are inheritance of the universe. What's a car? Big deal. Pony up, pops. Let's have one. Mm -hmm. You know, give them peace and love. And, and take away Millie's humble and loving respect, misguided, but respect for not asking for your, for your help and things. You want us to, to ask. It says that, that angels are ministering spirits to bring things to us, to the believers. Well, we're believers, and we're sitting here proving it across the entire world on the mm. World Wide Web. You don't want us to suffer. Uh, we can suffer a little bit to increase our faith, but, you know, we shouldn't have to walk places in a world of, of, of mechanization. We shouldn't have less than. I know that Satan honors these guys, and they have stuff, and they can be blessed. They can be the biggest piece of poop that ever that they've ever turned. Them. God doesn't make garbage, but people can do a real good job of making themselves into garbage. Mm. These are your children by your invitation. They need more in order to, to live a more glorious life, Lord. 
ask and you shall receive. Anything you ask in my name, should any two of you agree, it'll be done. While we're here, we're asking and we're agreeing and we're doing our very best to be, be the most competent, confident followers of your son mm. so that we can have relationship with you, dear God in heaven. You got a sense of humor? <laughs> I can't wait to hear a joke coming out of your mouth because it's going to be incredible. Knee slapper. And you know, you see what's going on here. So in the name and the authority given to me, given to Millie, given to Berto, by our acquiescence and accepting your son as our Lord and Savior for this entire universe, this entire, for past, present, and future, every sorrow, every heartache, mm. every pain, Every disease, every unhappiness was guaranteed that it was gone through his stripes. Guaranteed. What's a car? What's a financial windfall? I don't care how it comes. We don't care. You know, but Lord, we don't want it in a year. We want to like, you know, like soon. Now, I don't have a watch that says soon. I don't have a <laughs> piece of dollar that says extra. And I don't have anything that says, but, but you know what I'm talking about. You know, 30, 60, 90 days. Let's make it happen. You know, you have not because you ask not. Lord, we are, I'm not bashful. I don't know if Berto is. Millie's not bashful. Take that bashfulness away from her. Let her ask you, just like her children, your children that you mm -hmm. gave to her to guide and protect, mm -hmm. ask her. And in the name of your son and through the authority given to us as followers of Christ, I say amen. 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 Done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. Bingo. So you know my next there. words are, hang what? on. Ooh. Yes. Yeah. Hang on. <sighs> yeah. Hang on. Something's gonna happen. It may happen in the quietest moment. You, you have to get your antenna tuned. Something's going to happen. Lord, you never let me down. From hospitals to mm -hmm. finances, you never let me down. It's not going to happen this time. I'm not going to pray this again. I'm not going to have this conversation with you again. I'm going to daily celebrate the fact that you've made this happen because it is going to mm -hmm. happen, period. It's going to happen. Not one time, not one time has it not happened. Okay, I'm gonna use your faith. No, you need to have mine right. <laughs> well, I look have... at your children. Look at look at the faith that your children have in you. Mm. Should yours be any less to the to the to the being that created you? Should it? That's yes or no. Should it? Should your faith be less to God Almighty than your children have in you? Should it be less? Yes no. or no? No. Okay, live that. Know that. Every time your child asks you for a cookie or a, a egg or a breakfast. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Mm. And when you don't, you deny. How would you feel if your child never asked you and you watch him starve? How would you feel? Terrible. Well, what do you think he feels? You're starving. What do you think he feels? But you know, the thing about a lot of churches, and I say churches, teachers, they don't share this. It's our responsibility to ask. You just don't walk outside and manna falls down. Manna fell down because they were bitching them about not having anything to eat, mm. right? And when they got manna, they were bitching them about they didn't have any meat, and they had quail, right? It's because they asked. And right, Berto? Yeah. Okay, we're asking. Every time your children ask you for something, that's what you should be doing to God Almighty, asking mm. for something. Right? Yes or no? Yes. Thank you. Yes or no? <laughs> yes. Okay. There you yeah. go. Proclaim it. Speak it. You gotta, you know, you gotta renew your registration in the DMV. You can't just stand there with a paper in your hand. You have to ask for something. Mm. Right? Yeah. Okay. Everything requires action. R requires a request and ask. You have to ask. And then don't be surprised when it happens. Be surprised when it doesn't happen because it's gonna happen. I'll tell you about some atheist friend of mine. 
husband and wife, very idiosyncratic, really strange peeps, but I love them to death. The husband is, uh, he's been killed three times. He's died three times. He got electrocuted once. He got in a rock climbing accident once and something else happened. And he has really difficult uh, physiological stuff. He, he had an aorta in his, in his heart that instead of being the size of a cocktail straw was the size of a drumstick. And anyway, he had to go and have, uh, his heart was out of his chest for 17 hours and they put it all back together. And then they came to his wife and said, look, we made a mistake. His blood's leaking out through the sutures. We don't have enough stuff to clot his blood up. He's not going to live through the night. You can come back. You can sit here and watch him pass away, but you can come back in the morning and pick up his corpse. He's not living through the night. Jim Noon is his name, and his wife is Tony. And we were magicians together and friends. And she called me up and says, Mark, I just, I just wanted to let you know that Jim's not making it through the night. They told me he won't live. I can go pick him up his body tomorrow, but he won't live. I says, you know what, Tony? I'm not buying that. Mm. They call it practice for a reason. I have a relationship with a creator. He says, anything I ask in his name will be done, and I'm just not buying that crap. Jim's too good of a human being to disappear from the earth. Plus, I want him to have time to accept Christ, okay? I said, I'm going to get on a horn, and I'm going to call several of my friends who are believers, and we're going to tell God this one needs to be spared. Well, I don't know. It's just, I don't care what you think. That's what's going to happen. So I called two or three of my friends. Says, "Listen, I got a buddy, and he and we need to pray for him." I says, "Okay." So that was about eleven o'clock at night, and the next morning, Mrs. Noon Tony goes in to pick up her husband's corpse. He was sitting up asking for a cup of coffee. He didn't die. There's only one word that went through that entire hospital. It was a miracle. Mm. They didn't do any procedures to him. They, he was sitting up asking for a cup of coffee. You can tell me whatever you want to. Mm. I know what happened. So I've seen it. So you can say whatever you want to. You have not because you asked not. And... I listened to a, I don't know why, but I listened to a guy who had had gone from being a teenager in a Methodist church to being, the, you know, at about 14 to becoming the um, high priest of the Satanic Church in San Francisco. And uh, you become a Christian. And he says, well, why did you become a Christian? He goes, well, you know, I like power. And I didn't see any power coming out of the church that my parents took me to. And he went on to describe what, what happened and why he became a Satanist. And says, and I kept hearing about this this guy, Christ, was powerful. So one day I said, well, I'm just going to find out. So I invited Satan and Christ to both show up and see what happened. And you know, that guy, Christ, he kicked that other guy's ass. And I'm not going with a loser. I decided to become a Christian. I want that power. Wow. You know? I like... want that, yeah. And he said, when I was, when I was a Satanist, we would get together, and our, our coven's mission was to go into churches and disrupt them. You know, get the really cute chicks with all, all the bumps in the right places to, to get the minister to fall or get this or that or to distract them and so on and so forth. And, and it worked. We, did it. We, had, we were very successful until we would go to churches where the Christians understood and knew the power that they possessed through being mm -hmm. a Christian. And says, and when we would go to those churches, we could not physically walk in the door. Wow. We were forbid. We could not physically push our way into the door. We couldn't get into the buildings. Wow. And it reminded me of Marty, who says, you pushed me. Mm -hmm. I wasn't anywhere near the guy. The presence of Christ in that home would not allow him to walk. He goes, what's on the wall? And there's like voodoo stuff inside. I says, no, Marty, those are crucifixes, Christian crucifixes. Oh, I don't know what it is, man, but I get, mm -hmm. you know. We possess that power. The church that I'm a member of, like I said, I felt a little bit of demonic action in there, even through dissent or whatever. So I, 
I said to the minister, I offered three times. Finally, the last time I says, I'm going to go in there and, you know, where we have the authority to cast that son of a bitch out of here. Well, I spent 20 years as a contractor and I'm, I know I have a propensity to be fairly, uh, being very modest, profane at times. So he finally took my, took my, I says, if you want to come, you're welcome to. When the COVID first started, a quick digression, COVID first started, without anybody's knowledge, I went to the church I'm a member of, and I walked to every corner of that of that property, and I, I told Satan that you are rejected. You are rejected. You do not have the ability, the authority to step foot on this property. No matter who has come here for whatever reason to celebrate, to acknowledge, to be curious, or to celebrate Christ and a you are not allowed to touch them. You are not allowed on this property, and you are not allowed to touch anybody that's ever come onto this property. You're rejected. You're you're out of here, you know. And nobody in my church died of COVID. One guy's in his 90s. He caught it twice. Never died. Nobody died of COVID. He says, I'm not going to allow it. Christ says, whatever, I have the same power that he had. I'm not going to allow it. Through Jesus of Nazareth, you are not allowed to be here. Adios, Father Mucker. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so I accept my, the minister, really a wonderful guy, real. He just, he, he's, he's been given a boat with too many holes in the bottom. I don't think he can plug them all. But I says, I'm going to, Jason, I'm going to go in there and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to get down. He goes, if you want to go. Well, I'm, I know this is far to believe, but I'm fairly outspoken. I know it's hard for you to understand that's true, but <laughs> yeah. so I went into the sanctuaries. I'm starting here, man. I had a freaking yelling match, and I told you, son of a so and so, you get the f out of here, and you're not allowed in here. And I can smell you, I can see, you, I know you're here, and you are rejected from this moment forward. You are cast out of this place. And this went on for about twenty minutes. Let's go to the other room. I went to another room, and. By the minister's admission and agree, we could feel things leaving, going, ah, 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 and leaving those rooms. We could feel them leaving those rooms. Mm -hmm. You're rejected. You are out of here. You you are commanded to leave, and in the name and the authority of Jesus of Nazareth, you are commanded to leave this building. You could feel them leaving. So, that's the authority that you have. That's authority that you have. That's the authority to everybody that mm. that is a that that has accepted the light and the love and the reality of Jesus of Nazareth. That's their authority. That's their heritage. That's their mm. honor, their duty, and their privilege and responsibility to understand that. Satan is terrified that you and you and I and everybody will learn that because he has to go. Hmm. He doesn't have a choice. He has to go. I I have experience for time. I pray for these people and I I feel energy in my hands. Yes. Like when you touch like uh, with your tongue, yeah. like a body, that's exactly the same feeling. And then I I stop for a moment and I pray for their soul, for evil come out yeah right because i feel like what what is this my first encounter was with a little girl four years old okay crying every night at two in the morning okay so one day i hear her and i go and i knock the door my next door neighbor and i ask the mother can you let me pray for the girl because she's sick or what's going on she's crying every night right. two or three in the morning Right. So she grabbed me and pulled me inside her house it was like a mess, like a hoarder all over bad confusion. And I come at her room. The baby's sleeping and she started telling me something black is coming for my daughter uh, every uh, night. Uh, yeah. And in her parts, they say she's like abused, but the only people who take I went to the school and she you know nothing is in the school and her father watched her we separated my my sister is at the hospital she tries to 
suicide, you know, commit suicide. And it's like, oh boy, what is this? So I saw the bigger picture, right? But I said like, poor, let me pray for her. And I put my hands on that little girl mm -hmm. and she was electrocuting me like this. I believe every bit of that, yeah. And I was like, I don't know what to do. I, but, but I thought, whatever it is here, God is stronger. And I, I can pray, but I start singing, you know, uh, God is here and whatever song I was. And then I told the mother, it's nothing I can do for you. Read the Bible. And I give her a Bible and go and look for help at your church. Mm. Right. But, and that, but it is, is recently again, you know, I'm touching people. And I remember one time we went to LA and I prayed for a homeless and I, I asked him, give me your hands. And he doesn't allow me to touch. feel him, to yeah. touch him. He was doing like this, like he doesn't want to you know what? give me his whole hands. Yeah. Like, so one time I prayed for one of my neighbors that his house was born. Right. And he came and I pray and I, f I f have the feeling again. So Beto finished praying. I, I grab his hands. I touch in his uh, chest. I put my hand in his chest, chest. I pray for him. And the next day he came like nothing. He what the, the first time he was like sad, depressed, lonely, no hope. I pray for him. And at the next day he was like a different guy. Totally. There you go. There you go. So I know, I know how God works. I know his power. But um, yeah, I'm weak in that area. I don't like to pray for my things. Why not? I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's it hard. If it comes to you, then it goes it's to your children hard. too. You're going to deny your children? Yeah, and, and, and I don't want to pass that to my kids. That's because all I'm saying the they, blessings that they, come to you, you pass on to your children. Yes, yes. And sometimes my kids come to me and they like, Mommy, you think one day we're gonna have a house? Mommy, you think because they don't see that possible. No. And then yeah. I worry because I don't want to pass that to my kids. Right. So it's something I need to keep praying, you know? Well, I okay. I'm not the I'm not the brightest guy in the world. I would just say to you that every time your children ask you for something, know that it's your responsibility to ask your father for something. Mm -hmm. That he's waiting for you to ask him. You know, and when you're completely exhausted and nothing, you know there's nothing you can do, and then it happens, you know it has to be God's hand. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he allows you to become exhausted so that in your weakness you can see his strength. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. That's a wrap. Thank you, Mark. Wrap it up, Poppy. For an amazing nah, I'm nobody. story conversation. Yeah, I'm just a guy that rubs dead cows. <laughs> yeah. It's great. Millie, what do you want to say to conclude people tuning in? Like yesterday we were talking you know, about the pastors and the legacy. And I really believe, Mark, that you have a huge legacy. I do have you a know, legacy. And you're living it. The legacy it. is behind you. <laughs> yeah. And you're living it. So well, thank you for being the light and the soul of this world. And it's, okay. it's so authentic. Because I know the people you are touching, these people who Christians are rejecting. You know? And mm. Jesus is for everyone. Well, I'm going to amend that. I'm going to say that mm. I think that Christians need to be touched. Mm -hmm. I think that they're walking around like we get what's left over. You don't get what's left over. You get mm -hmm. the first pick. Well, you know, if it's God's will. If it wasn't yes, God's will, we he, have that if attitude. it wasn't God's will, he wouldn't have sent his son to die for you. Yeah. You know? Right? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I'm just going to say yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, really. <laughs> yeah. You have a... I'm walking, I'm in Super King Market. I'm buying myself a bottle of scotch. I like drinking scotch. And there's a guy standing, oh, about where that camera is, away from the young man. It's, and he's going, ah, you can take your Jesus Christ and all your mysteries and mythical stuff, and you can stick it up your blah, 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 blah. And, well, that guy's on it. I walk past him, and I get about 
four feet past and I get this, hey. I turn around and say, shut the fuck up. <laughs> you don't believe in God? No. You will someday. I'll pray for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know what he says? He says, thank you. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I told that demon to shut his freaking mouth. Oh my goodness, yes. Yeah. I yes. just I, and I yell it, shut the fuck up. And he went, oh. I got slapped him. Mm. This was what was in me mm. was greater than what was in him. Mm. You got grief? Remember who you are. You're the you're the daughter. You're the because someone asked you. You're the daughter of Almighty God. You aren't primordial ooze. That's your that's that's your responsibility. Mm. Salvation isn't free. It's not free. You had to acquiesce your will. Mm. Right? Nothing's free. Salvation isn't free. But with that, it's like winning a lottery. Now you get to do this, but you have to know. And these these people who are Christian don't understand the power that oozes out of them. But you, you know, if you play golf, I'm not a golfer anymore. You bored me into tears. But you get a whole bag full of clubs. You don't have to use one club. There's all kinds of different ones. You know, we don't have to pray for blessings. Oh, bless me! Uh, you have to pray. Look, I've got I got ten fingers. I got ten toes. You have to pray to be able to acknowledge and accept the blessings that come your way. I'm not hungry. You're not hungry. I'm clothed to the to the, the way I want to be. I've got a car to drive. I've got wonderful friends here. I'm how many how many blessings can I? I you know I feel a breeze on my face. A dog wags his tail when he sees me. Mm. I'm I'm incredibly blessed. I don't need to pray for blessings. Allow me to accept the blessings that come my way. Allow me to see them and understand them. Mm. I have more. There's not enough paper, pens, pencils, or typewriters or to count the blessings you have. Not from the time you wake up. Mm. You have children that adore you that you've that God Almighty has entrusted. Mm -hmm. He trusts you so much. He gave you beings that He made for you to take care of. You talk about a babysitter? You trust a babysitter? No. Well, he trusted you. That's what you are. You're a baby. Wow. Those aren't your those aren't your kids. Those aren't your children. Yes. They came from your body, but they aren't your children. They're his. They're yes. his children. That's right. Yes. Yeah. That's right. And he trusted you with those. Thank that you for that. Amen. <laughs> and that's a, res a privilege and a Huge responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. And I take it. Yeah. And so I want I Limp noodle Christians just bore me under tears. Well, you know, if I, yeah, well, you know, if it's God's will, if it's God's will be done, you know, God's will be done. Well, yeah, but if it's God's will, if it wasn't His will, why would He send His Son to die for you? Mm. Why would He invite you to be His child and an heir to to all eternity if it wasn't His will? If your child is starving and doesn't ask for food, is he gonna? I, I just it just blows my mind the ignorance, mm. the ignorance of it. And in my opinion, it's an affrontation to God Almighty. You would be offended if your children starved to death without asking you, wouldn't you? Why did you come to me? Am I wrong? Yes or no? Yes. You're. I'm wrong. Okay. All right. I'm not wrong. I am wrong. Oh, okay. Well, you're not. No. <laughs> But not all the time. That's that's my problem because sometimes I have so problem. much it's so much faith. For example, my son apply for uh, Pacifica Christian School. Okay, it's a, a high school. Yeah, right. And right. my son is asking me, "Mommy, you think I'm gonna get it in?" Yeah, it's full scholarship. And I tell him, "Yes," because I hear God. I was in this beautiful reunion with two principals, all the parents. My son is doing the exam yeah. downstairs. I'm upstairs and I'm look. I'm looking at the beautiful view, you know, the the ocean, and I hear God telling me, "I brought you so far to be in this place, yeah, because this is your people, and your son is gonna get in." Yeah, and I was like, "How'd that, how'd that work out for?" Crying, and I, 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 
I believe that 100%. So what I'm getting happened? out. What, what happened? He's in. Imagine that. And you He's need in. A, and you need a car. And he told oh, me, please. And, and he told me, oh, I just, I'm going to, I'm going to digest that for <laughs> you got that and you need a car. Okay. <laughs> Oy. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about, you know, what I'm talking about this. Yes, yes, okay. Yes. Yeah. Love it. We shouldn't pray for a car. We should pray for another scooter for you. As long as that, <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's what you're <laughs> no, I, I told you I need a van, an electric one for eight people. Because I know he can he can get me that. Like Well there you go. Yes. Tell him what color you want. What color? Oh, it's a beautiful color out that there. Gray, it's gray, that gray like gray likes like mate but shiny. Mate. It's yeah. a new color. Kinda mate like the couch, but not so shiny, right? No, it's like the walls. Yeah. But shiny. It's weird. I know what you're talking about. It's like a 1951 Plymouth Ford or sedan. I was there. I understand. I make colors for a living. Those have mm -hmm. no oh, yeah. They make. They have no depth. I don't. I don't know. It's me gusto. See, <laughs> no me gusto. Me gusto has rojo con looks like candy. That's cool or dark blue. Yeah, nice. but, but that's for you. So you get my drift. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I just want to have that fate all the time. Well, why don't you? Because count your fingers. <sighs> Ten. Count your toes. Another 10. You're blessed. Yes. What's a car? Can you make a finger? Can Detroit make a finger? Mm -mm. Can they make a car? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I'm, that's it. I'm full faith that you're going to have what you, what you need. What you need just because Millie needs it. Listen, another one. We need air conditioner at the office. Right? This feels pretty good right here. Yeah, it was was hot. The people were like like all the sweat, like dripping bad, bad, bad. In here? And I told Beto, yeah. yes. Okay. Okay. I told Beto. Three weeks ago. $5,000, which money we don't have. And I told Beto, Beto, I say yes to that. Because that air conditioner, it's not for us. It's for the people who's going to come and they're going to enjoy and we want to have beautiful conversations and we want to share Jesus. So we need air conditioner. How'd that work out for you? And I thought, I told him, it's God chilly. <laughs> is going to pay for it. It's chilly today. Just use your credit card, but don't worry. God is going to pay for it. Pastor Mike arrived. And he's like, oh. Yeah, surpresa, surprise is for you too because no we have to say, yeah. one more for him, you know. And he's like, Well, you know, I just can help you, but I will give you only maybe thousand dollars. Like, Pastor Mike, you don't worry, God is gonna pay for it, right? It's okay. And we're talking about a truck, <laughs> and then and then Pastor Mike, uh, like moments later, he screamed at Beto, Beto, I'm paying for it. All of it. So God did it. What and we are debt free because I asked him, I need to be debt free. What, what a surprise. <laughs> I'm so surprised. <laughs> uh, aren't you so, I'm so surprised. <laughs> what? Oh. Pinch me, pinch me. Mm. Oh, I'm so surprised. <laughs> <laughs>